Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to Pop Goes the 60s. I'm Matt Williamson, and I am going to do a book review with Steve Matteo, the writer of Act Naturally. This is a book, of, as you might suspect, on the Beatles films. And Steve has got quite a long resume. I'm going to turn it over here to Steve to talk a little bit about his background, because um, it's quite impressive. Steve, welcome. Hi. It's great to be here, Matt. So tell us, we, you and I had a chance to meet at Beetle Fest in Chicago this past summer. And we talked a little bit about, and I was very impressed with your resume. Can you just give uh, the viewers here a little bit of background on yourself? Sure, I'll, I'll give you the checkered past, the checkered musical past. <laughs> I mean, I've been writing about music for a long time, decades. Uh, I really started out in radio. That's really what I wanted to do. And then I ended up writing about music because I felt there was more freedom to write about what I wanted to write about, what kind of music, you know, that I was interested in. So over the years, I, you know, I've written for all the usual suspects. I've written for Rolling Stone and Spin, and I've written for the New York Times. Uh, here in New York, I've also written for Newsday, Time Out New York, a New York Magazine, you know, Salon, L, Interview, mostly about music, but I've, I've written about other things too over the years. Um, this is my third book. My first book was on Bob Dylan. Uh, my second book was on the Beatles on the Let It Be album. That was part of the 33 and a third series, which I think, you know, a lot of your viewers probably know about that series. And so this is the latest. It came out here in the States in May. Uh, it came out in England in uh, July. And right after I saw you in Chicago, we went to, we flew to London to do some publicity and promotion and do some other fun things there that I'll tell you about later. So uh, it, it's, you know, this, I, this is all I've been doing pretty much <laughs> other than my journalism is just, you know, promoting the book. It, you know, it's been reviewed. I've done radio interviews. I've done Zoom podcasts, you know, you know any new formats the kids are into these days. So uh, it's, it's a lot of fun. I mean, we've had some activities. We did a screening of a hard day's night that I introduced and then, in, you know, answered questions. Um, I, I did a, when I was in London, I did a sort of this club thing where they had a guy come on before me and play some Beatles music. And then they had a duo come on after me after I was interviewed. And that was fun. Uh, it was at this venue actually that's Bob Dylan. It's one of Bob Dylan's first concerts in England, this venue, it was something different at the time when he played there. But Oasis has played there and Katy Perry and it's, it's been fun. It's been fun. So you started to do uh, your third book, uh, your second on the Beatles, Act Naturally, Beatles on Film. And did you see a, a place that there was maybe needed some more elaboration in the Beatles film career? What, what made you choose this, this subject matter? Yeah, I mean, that's basically it. It's been a really long time since there's been any books on the films. And, you know, as I've said in other interviews over the years, there's been a lot of really good books on the films, in some cases on the individual films, particularly A Hard Day's Night. But there really hasn't been anything in a while. And as you know, through the years, we've had all these reissues of the films on DVD, on Blu-ray, uh, the reissues of the soundtrack albums on CD, on vinyl. Uh, and then the Get Back series, the Peter Jackson series, uh, the timing of that was sort of perfect. So uh, I just thought I just thought it was a great time, you know, because I did the Let It Be book. I'm already sort of interested in this place where music meets visuals or film or movies or, or whatever the case may be. So it just it really intrigues me. And I'm, I'm interested in film. Um, you know, I love going and living in the 60s, I mean, you do a lot of videos about music from artists from the 60s. I mean, that's what that's what your show's all about. It's a very rich period. And you, you get to sort of get, you know, get in the little time machine and you get to go sort of live there. And I, I you know, wanted this to be more than just, you know, the Beatles made a hard day's night and then they made help and then they made Magical Mystery Tour. I wanted there to be a lot of connective tissue about other films of the period, particularly in the British cinema realm. And, you know, talk about other music that was going on. 
you know, sort of sociocultural, you know, as you know, there's a lot about the sort of psychedelic experience when we get into the uh, magical mystery tour in the yellow submarine part. I get into that, you know, quite a bit in terms of what was happening in London, what was happening in San Francisco. Um, you know, I wanted it to be sort of a, a sort of a fuller kind of picture. And, uh, you know, I think it's, it's not critical, I, you know, as you know, reading it, it's not a critical analysis. I mean, I make observations and I, I try to put things together, but I think I'm really more of a journalist and maybe, you know, sort of a historian. I think that's, that's what interests me and give the information and let people decide for themselves, you know, what do they think of things or, you know, have it raise questions, you know? Well, for me, the value was the historical content you put around these films because you go very much in depth, if, for example, in the first chapters, uh, British film. Now, Americans, some of them know some of the, the main films, but this was kind of like you say, the your interest in uh, the marriage of film and music. The 60s was the decade where that really started to, uh, to blossom. We see it a little bit in the late 50s in some of the what's called the jukebox musicals. And very quickly, the Beatles, amazingly, their first film was not going to be a jukebox musical. And you give some very good background on not just British film, but some of the distributors, the film studios, uh, British New Wave of the 50s. Why don't you tell us a little bit about going into the Hard Day's Night period where British films were at the time? Sure. I mean, you know, Hollywood has always been sort of ground zero for the history of, of film, for popular film. You know, it's not obviously where film began, but, you know, Hollywood movies always sort of ruled. And then after World War II, you get France and Italy and, you know, some other countries to some degree who, who start making interesting films, new films, and in some cases, popular films and start being very influential. And British films really are not quite there yet. There's always been good British films. You know, uh, British filmmakers make quality films. There's always been good stuff, but there's never really been a big movement of any kind. And so what happens in sort of the wake of films exploding in Italy and particularly France, it becomes influential on England. And England is going through this this change, this post-war change. You know, we, we, we always forget here in America that, you know, you know, England, London was bombed during World War II. And so these folks are coming out of this experience. And, you know, they're still in some cases being rationed. You know, people live near bomb sites. And, you know, this is sort of the end of the sort of British empire. You know, it's that England is really changing you know, where America now has really emerged as the world power. Now, maybe that's too much to think about in terms of a pop music movie, but it influences these important films that come up prior to A Hard Day's Night in England. And many of them fall under this genre called kitchen sink films. And they're sort of like the reality of what people are grappling with post-war in England, particularly men, particularly males, as, you know, as England is change now it's not the superpower it's not the empire it's not the leader of the world uh you know so it's it and it creates some you know very compelling films and we start seeing the emergence of you know great british film directors or the continuation of some great british filmmakers but what it really does is you suddenly now have a very distinctly british film and you have these actors emerging, these great actors, you know, Richard Burton, you know, Albert Finney, Tom Courtney. I mean, the list is sort of endless. I mean, and some of these folks are still making films today. You know, they're still out there. And it's this extraordinary period, Julie Christie and Peter O'Toole and, you know, Sean Connery and Peter Sellers. And I could go on and on and on. You get the picture. So it's, it's very significant. So it's, it's happening right as the Beatles are getting ready and make A Hard Day's Night. And what also happens prior to A Hard Day's Night is the Bond films. You know, the first James Bond movie comes out in 1962, Dr. No. So you have these two things kind of happening 
where suddenly now, if you really think about it, at that time, sort of James Bond and the Beatles, anything cooler than that, you know? I mean, obviously Ian Fleming, he wrote the novels long before any of the films were ever made. I don't even think he lived long enough to even see Dr. No. I, I always forget exactly what that is. But so this is now, the, this is the center of the universe in many ways. And then of course, later we will have what's called swing in London, but that's getting a little, a little ahead of ourselves. Not by much though, because when the Beatles did hit, it certainly started to swing. And I think the Beatles, A Hard Day's Night, the kitchen sink style film, I guess that's kind of a working class t style, correct? And the Beatles yes. certainly fit into that. Unlike, I think, the other jukebox musicals or those quick cash and rock and roll films that I don't think really had that feel to them. Certainly in America, the beach blanket type of films didn't have that at all. So you, you've got these cheesy British films, cash in type of musical films. In America, you've got the beach films and then Hard Day's Night comes out. And, and what happens is those films that you mentioned, the sort of cheesy ones or whatever, they are sort of part of this continuum because what, what they all are is movies aimed at these baby boomer teenagers, this, this thing, the teenager. That, that was never a thing until the baby boomers came along. So it's all of these movies that are trying to appeal to young people, where in the past you had very distinctly made films for adults, which some young people would watch, of course. And then you had movies that were very distinctly for children. You know, and I mean children, I mean preteens. Mm -hmm. So now you suddenly have this, this sort of new kind of momentum in the culture, these teenagers, these baby boomers, who here in America, obviously, become the largest part of the population because of this, this extraordinary baby boom that goes on. And, and when we say baby boom, we're talking about people born between 1946 and 1964, which is interesting because that's when A Hard Day's Night comes out. So it's sort of like, you know, you've got the ones that were born in 46, so they're all ready for it, you know? So that's, 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 really, that's really the sort of kind of historical kind of starting place. What I would suggest is that I always look at the Beatles films from an artistic standpoint, and you can certainly make, make the claim in every, all five of their main films that there's a great deal of artistic license that they took. Sometimes it worked well, sometimes not so well. So obviously in A Hard Day's Night, it worked really well. It probably, hard, I guess I've always felt that's easily their best film. Although, you know, the Let It Be stuff and now the Get Back, that starts to tell a, a fuller story. Does that make it a better film? Well, maybe not. It's a little bit lo on the long side, but Hard Day's Night certainly has a lot of meat on the bone from an artistic standpoint. Right. Yes. And, you know, what is interesting about it is so they're making this essentially as a quickie pop music movie. That's kind of what United Artists thought they were getting into. And but what ends up happening is you get these extremely talented people who work on the film, who, you know, Richard Lester, this, this director, you know, first and foremost, I mean, we, we have to mention Richard, but other people who work on the film, I, I, I've said this in many interviews, the, um, the director of cinematography, Gilbert Taylor, also worked on Dr. Strangelove, just to give you a sense of who he is, his credentials. And in many cases, if you look at all of the, and I, as you know, I detail this in the book, the people behind the scenes are, are, you know, serious filmmakers who will have already made some important films, in some cases, some of the kitchen sink films or even well before that, and who will go on to make more important British films and films in general. And some of these folks who work on these Beatle films in the 60s will go on to work on, for example, the Lord of the Rings films. Uh, the Harry Potter films. So you, you get a sense that, you know, while the intention was by United Artists to, well, we want to get the soundtrack album. And so let's sign these Beatles up uh, and make a quick buck. <laughs> and obviously there's more to it than that. 
you know, it ends up being a, a, a quality movie. It ends up being an, a really important film for the time and very influential even till this day. Yeah, and you, like you stated, the people that are involved, I mean, it, the success and the quality, it's no accident. I mean, they really, the Beatles turned down a couple of offers to do the quickie cash in jukebox musical. And they said, we don't want to do that because they had a very good, strong sense of self very early on. And because of that, they were just so discerning in that way. I think is the reason we got a guy like Alan Owen helping to write it. And he was one of the guys, was he from Liverpool or? Yes, Alan, well, he was from Liverpool. He, what's interesting is he was a playwright. So this is a very literary man. Anybody that, you know, toils in the theater is, you know, is, is, he's literary, you know? So he's not just some guy who's, this is just a job. He's picking up a paycheck, you know, obviously the fact that he understood who they were because Liverpool was a place that, you know, people that had no idea Liverpool, where is that? What is, it's all about London. You know what I mean? It's all about the South. That's what, that's what England was all about. And so here you have this place way up North called Liverpool and, you know, the obvious differences in, just in the dialects alone, you know, the way that the Beatles spoke, the Scouse, or, you know, there's different ways that it's described. And so he was able to capture the, you know, the, it capture their speech in a very authentic way, but he understood their background and where they came from. He understood their sort of unique kind of sense of humor. Now, of course, later on, John Lennon, you know, he, he disparaged Owen to some degree. And, you know, it's odd that he, Owen never really did anything beyond A Hard Day's Night in the film world. He continued to work as a playwright, and I think he worked more and more in television, but it was A Hard Day's Night seemed to be the kind of almost a peak for him. So uh, that, and that was it. He didn't work with the Beatles again. He didn't, he didn't, he didn't write any more screenplays. So um, he, he's important, but Lester is, Lester is just the right man at the right time. It's interesting, the Beatles in the beginning, they seem to, they seem to connect with the right people at the right time who put them on the right course and were sort of perfect collaborators for them. You know, whether we're talking about Lester or we're talking about, you know, Brian Epstein or we're talking about George Martin, you know, all of these folks just seem to be the, the right person at the right time. That's a very good point. I never heard it put that way because as we see as the Beatles career continues into the late sixties, they're not connecting with those people anymore. In fact, you might say they're connecting with the people <laughs> that are the wrong people. So right. early on, I mean, they really, they were drawing these people to them and they sought Alan Owen out in this, in this instance and Dick Lester to some degree. I mean, they knew his work and they knew what they were in for with Lester. They admired him. And was it the Standing Still film? Right. I mean, what basically happened is it's United Artists signs up Walter Shenson to be the producer. It's Walter who brings in Richard Lester, but of course the Beatles, you know, they've got to, for lack of a better word, approve it, you know? And so then also Alan Owen is brought in. It's not really the Beatles bringing these people in. It's really, it's really Shenson and Lester. And it's, it's all kind of working out and falling into place. I mean, they don't know how to make movies. They're musicians, you know, they're, they're pop stars. So they were used to working you know, with George Martin, where Martin was the producer, you know, he ran the sessions and whoever the engineer was did, did that aspect of it. And basically once the songs were recorded, the Beatles stepped away and the, the mixing, the mastering, banding, sequencing, they, they, they did not do that. I mean, now later on, of course, as we get to like Rubber Soul, Revolver, their involvement with all aspects it becomes a lot more all encompassing, particularly as we get to the white album. So, um, you know, it is just kind of all sort of working out. And, you know, some of these things are, you know, it just, they're serendipity. They're being at the right place at the right time. And I think it's also interesting to note too, that you have people who are Americans who are already working in England and the, the Beatles like Americans. <laughs> They're, you know, the main influence on their music, well, obviously, is American music. You know, American rock and roll, rhythm and blues, you know, wh whatever the case may be. So Lester being an American, that was almost a plus as far as the Beatles were concerned. 
Yeah, I agree. I mean, they they were their timing was perfect, and there's so much going on in the '60s that I mean, not everybody was able to capitalize on the time like the Beatles went up. Obviously, they were the biggest thing going immediately once they once they broke and Beatlemania hit. So they 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 were out in front of everybody, but everybody seemed to follow. All of a sudden, there's all these British bands that are in movies. We got like um, the Animals and Herman's Hermits and Freddie and the Dreamers and uh, a bunch of others. You know? Yep, Dave Clark Five, Jerry and the Pacemakers. The list yeah. is kind of endless. Yeah. One of the things I liked about your book, you you talked about all of those films, and one one group we didn't mention that was in a film were the Rolling Stones, and you go into reasons why they were not in films because it wasn't for lack of trying no no that was you know th this is what happens is when you when you do these books you know it's interesting when people they oh you wrote a book on the beatles wow you must be know everything about the beatles you must be an expert and it's like no no it, you don't get it it's the way it works is i have a certain amount of knowledge and passion for the music but once you start researching that's where the learning is and you find out these things you have no idea i mean I, you know i never really thought about oh yeah the rolling stones did they make any movies you know obviously later on they do the rock and roll cir circus which takes forever to get released they do this thing called charlie is my darling which another thing that gets released way later in the game or, you know, it may have just come out very briefly and then just faded away, not to make a joke there. And, you know, the whole story of what they wanted to do or might have done was fascinating when I when I kind of I almost stumble across some of these things, you know, and I just thought it was interesting. And it gives you a sense, too, of kind of who the players are, you know, and the Stones very much followed the Beatles. I mean, I think obviously there is a point where the Stones kind of, they exceeded, you know, the Beatles very much. And then the, the Beatles broke up and then the Stones continued on, you know, and they made some of their best albums really after the Beatles broke up. Sticky Fingers, Exile on Main Street, uh, you know, Some Girls, long after the Beatles are completely finished. And of course, one of, if not the greatest live band ever. I mean, that's not something the Beatles would ever you know, be in the running for, but finding out about these possibilities of films. And I mean, it was really perfect. I mean, they had a look, they, and Jagger, obviously one of the ultimate front men, you know, he has this appeal and it, it's, that's what was so interesting about Charlie is my darling is the whole idea was Andrew Luke Oldman. He thought Charlie Watts was the star and he should be out front. And my guess is the reason why was because Charlie was the, the fancy dresser. Charlie was from birth. He was a, just a dresser. He loved to dress up. I mean, it didn't matter. Even in the height of the 60s hippies, he was immaculately dressed. I had a chance to interview Bill Wyman twice. And one of the questions that I asked him was, who's Charlie's tailor? <laughs> Of course, he wouldn't tell me, he claimed he didn't know. But so, yeah, that's a little sidelight that I, I thought was interesting. And I'm glad you picked up on that. Yeah. And the book has got a lot of that. That's what makes us rich, because many of us, we do know the Beatles films and we, we know the backstory a bit. But I, when you put it into a wider context of other films and other bands, and you include music, you discuss music in this book as well. And let's face it, that the 60s, when they started coming out with soundtracks, there was a, a desire to have a hit song on the soundtrack. Like one example you bring up in the book is What's New Pussycat, Tom Jones. And that was an example where uh, that song was a huge hit and uh, everybody tried to do that. Then the Beatles' next album after Hard Day's Night, certainly it also followed some trends as well. They weren't setting the trends as much as they were with the Hard Day's Night but uh, help became kind of an amalgam of all these different things going on in the sixties. Yeah. I mean, it, there was a, that, I love that album. I think it's, a, I think it's a great album. That's, a, you know, it's a great period for them. You know, I mean, it's interesting United artists, part of the reason why they were smart enough to sign up the Beatles for a soundtrack album was they had United Artists records. And the key to that label was soundtrack albums. And they realized how lucrative this was. And they also had this very strong presence 
in London. And that's how they knew about the extent of Beatlemania, how big it was. So, you know, so they were already on that. And then other, you know, other people, other artists and record companies would realize, yeah, soundtracks. And yes, help, help like the, the, the Capital Help album, like the United Artists, A Hard Day's Night album is a soundtrack album. It has, you know, it has incidental music. It is a, it's a package. It's a something, it's like a souvenir of the film almost. But there is some really great music there. The 1965 period for the Beatles, this sort of Beatlemania is over. You know, we're not doing covers really anymore. We've, we got Beatles for sale out of our system, which I actually don't think is as bad an album as people think it is. And before they get psychedelic, so they're able to sort of write these perfect sort of pop songs, you know, and it's almost it's almost the sort of kind of electric folk rock sort of thing, almost, you know, they're obviously very influenced by Dylan. You know, they hear the birds. Of course, the birds sound is partially influenced by them. You know, the, the 12 string Rickenbacker, you know, and so the birds then kind of, well, they hear that and they're like, yeah, we like that. <laughs> and so you, that's a great time. That's sort of 65, 66, you know, before everything gets psychedelic, which I, I love psychedelic music, but I'm just saying there's sort of a simplicity and a purity to that sort of pop sound of 65, 66, you know, not just the Beatles. That is just, and, and you've covered it extensively on on your channel yeah you notice that films in even the late 50s start in bringing in more surrealism into the filmmaking and that kind of almost goes off the rails by 67 so yeah 65 66 is still giving it to us pretty straight and one of the things i noticed about help is that you know you've got these great bond movies that are, are all the rage and the beatles kind of it's, it's spy spoof Right. It wasn't the first spy spoof, British spy spoof. No. It was, it, but the spy spoof became almost uh, a trend as well, not just the spy movie, but the spy spoof. Yes. And they find themselves in this. And I think the, the background of how they did help, it's kind of all over the place, you know, attack shelter, let's go to the Bahamas. <laughs> it, it's never, you know, John Lennon, oh, Dick Lester forgot who we were. It's a hodgepodge. And the movie, sometimes when you do the research on it, that's kind of how it comes off. But really, visually, it's not. No. And, and Dick Lester loved the way that it was photographed. He just thought it was beautiful in terms of it was a new way to sort of do color cinematography. And he really loved it. And Lester has always said he prefers help to A Hard Day's Night. So, yeah. And you, and you definitely, you tap right into the whole idea of the spy spoof thing. I mean, it was, it was such a big thing once the Bond movies hit and I, that, I have a soft spot for 60 spy movies and for spy spoofs. And, you know, one of the people who did great soundtrack music in that period and then went on for decades after was John Barry. And he did, of course, the, some of the Bond music. And I had a chance to interview him for a story for the New York Times. And I asked him about Austin Powers, because at the time it was just out. And I asked him what he thought of it. And he said, how do you spoof a spoof? Because <laughs> yeah. he felt like the Bond films were spy spoofs. That, you know, they were, that the, the Fleming novels were almost spy spoofs. And the films were totally spoofs that was kind of kind of his kind of his take on it you know which i which i thought was interesting but um yeah i i i don't know i love help i think it's a great movie it's a lot of fun to watch i know that some people say nowadays you know everything has to be politically correct and we could argue that either way that you know there are aspects of it that are somewhat you know political maybe a little politically incorrect but you know and every, they're kind of harmless that's how i see it um, we did a screening of A Hard Day's Night at a cinema um, out by where I live, a kind of an art house cinema that, you know, plays, you know, older films and arty films and that sort of thing. And everybody loved it. I mean, we, it was sold out. People were asking questions. I mean, we had to shut it down. People didn't want to stop asking questions. And then afterwards, a lot of people hung around. And I don't know how many people that either came up to me or the people that run the cinema and said, so you're going to show help next? 
you know, people wanted to see that. And we, I never really got a straight answer out of the people who, who run the cinema, but I think there's a sense that it is, it is not really in circulation. Although I, I think that, I think you can watch it on, see now I forget if it's Magical Mystery Tour or Help, I think you can watch on one of those, one of those streaming channels with commercials like Tubi or something like that. But um, so the Karsh family owns A Hard Day's Night. They bought the rights to the film and all the memorabilia and the entire archive from Walter Shenson's estate. And then the Karsh family and the Beatles or Apple own help in conjunction with each other. So I guess in order to do anything with help, I guess both sides have to sort of have an agreement on you know the hows and the whys and that sort of thing. But I don't think I've ever seen it in recent times shown on you know cable TV or Netflix or streaming services. Um, I mean, obviously you can the, the DVD, the Blu-ray is readily available to purchase. I know it's in my library. If I want to go to my library and I want to take it out, I can I can take it out. It's it's available. But in terms of you know screenings, public screenings and movie theaters, I don't really know what the status is. Yeah, that's one that it seems like it could use a general general release. I know they did a box set of it. I can't remember how many years ago, and I never I didn't buy it at the time. And I bought it about two years ago, and I was it was really cheap, and I was surprised how substantial it was. There was a lot of nice stuff in it. It was. So that would have been a time when they maybe could have re-released it in, in, in cinema. I don't know. They might have. I know what you're talking about. I have that box too. I actually bought it after the fact. I didn't get it when it first came out. And it was a little pricey, but considering what you got in it, I was it was good value. You know, I, it really was a beautiful, I think it comes with a copy of the script. And it's a, I, I don't think it's a, the, I don't think there's a Blu-ray in that set though. That's the only thing. If you want to get the Blu-ray, I think you have to buy this specific Blu-ray. And the only one of the films that has the Criterion Collection treatment is A Hard Day's Night. And that's always fairly um, available and readily, you can see it on, on like HBO and like Turner Classic Movies, the same company, I believe, they, they're, they're owned by the same company. But yeah, help is kind of, kind of, you know, it's weird. It, it's, I, I love it. I mean, I know critically it did not do very well, obviously when it was first released compared to A Hard Day's Night. But, I, you know, obviously I, doing this book, I went back and I looked at it again and it was just fun. Yeah, my kids loved that one over A Hard Day's Night. I, I'm a Hard Day's Night fan, but help, the help film is Beatle fans are really, starting to talk more about it and saying that this is my favorite film. And it, so it's getting a lot of, a lot more as all Beatles stuff that the most obscure stuff gets is getting brought to the fore now by fans. And, um, and with the case of help, you know, with good reason. One thing I like to talk about since we're on help, they were going to do another movie. I think the following year, it looked like they were teeing it up to do a movie every year. And in 1966, they didn't do a, a, a film. Do you know any background on that at all? You know, there was a lot of different times once they did A Hard Day's Night and then once they did Help, where there were a lot of false starts. There was a lot of things being considered. There were things that were rumored. Uh, you know, they were supposed to possibly do this movie called A Talent for Loving, which was a Western, which did eventually get made. I think with uh, Lee Marvin, I think it was, if I'm not mistaken. But, and, the, and, you know, Ringo is a huge fan of country and Western music and Western films, and also George to some degree, but for whatever reason, they decided not to make it. Uh, you know, they were supposed to possibly do a, um, a film of a script of the playwright Joe Ortone, okay, which, you know, that never happened. And that particular script was way out there. That was, the Beatles were never going to make it. Brian outright rejected it. And I get into the whole drama of what happened around around that, the whole Joe Ortone period. I get into that in detail. Maybe I'll, I'll, I won't get into that now. Maybe I'll let readers read that for themselves in, in the book, because it is, it's a little extensive and it, and it does kind of go off the subject a little bit. But there are a lot of parts of my book that kind of go off the subject a little bit for, like you said, to create some context, you know. But um, they were going to possibly make the Lord of the Rings. I mean, they wanted to do it. And John was going to play Gandalf. 
But from what I understand is Tolkien said, no way. I'm not going to let those drugged out hippies make my make a, a movie out of my book, which is hard to believe. OK, I mean, in the Lord of the Rings, you know, there's the context of it today, obviously, since the Peter Jackson films. But at the time, it was very much a sort of counterculture tone. It was something that people in the counterculture read. And that was not where Tolkien was coming from. That was not his kind of that's not the kind of person he was. He wasn't a, he was an older man. He was very educated. He was a literary man. He, and, and the, the, the hippies sort of appropriated the Lord of the Rings. You know, it was one, one of the sort of books that they kind of appropriated as theirs. And of course, later on, the first Lord of the Rings film gets made and it's animated and it's made by Ralph Bakshi. And I interviewed him for this book which I thought he was perfect because of that, but also because, you know, with the Yellow Submarine part of the book, Ralph was one of the first directors to make feature length animated films for adults. And, you know, when the Beatles, when Yellow Submarine was made, they, there really wasn't full length animated feature films for adults. They were for children. They were mostly Disney films. And the Yellow Submarine was kind of different because it was made for the fans of the Beatles, for teenagers, people in their 20s to go and see for adults. And, you know, so Ralph had some, you know, he has some unique sort of context to put into it. It's interesting. He worked with the Rolling Stones, too, on some videos. So, um, you know, he, he was somebody that I, I felt really added it, the whole sort of context of animated movies and that because people don't realize that yellow submarine was something so different i know we're kind of we kind of jumped ahead there we kind of jumped past the elephant in the room which is magical mystery tour <laughs> yeah that's okay i mean uh that whole psychedelic period was films for adults whereas hard days night and help they feel like they're more films for kids so overnight almost we get this, which in 1967, you know, that both Yellow Submarine was was started, and we get Magical Mystery Tour, which is not a, a theatrical release, but a television only release in, in England. And we know the, the story on that, that that was the first Beatles dud. But obviously, they they were being they were making a film of the counterculture for the counterculture. And I think that this had a lot to do with them not touring anymore. They weren't really hanging out with kids. They weren't performing to kids. They were hanging out with people their own age in swing in London. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, Magical Mystery Tour is sort of like once the Beatles do Sgt. Pepper, it's like they can do whatever they want. I mean, it, 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 no one's going to tell them no. Sgt. Pepper is it's in many ways the sort of pinnacle of the 60s you know from a sort of artistic cultural point of view that really nothing nothing really touches it you know and so paul really is the one driving it paul is you know he's very ambitious paul is you know he's a, he's just into everything he's he's dating an actress he's very interested in the theater he's interested in avant-garde filmmaking uh, he's interested in art. He's interested in literature. He's involved with the Indica Bookshop. Um, he's living in London uh, at this time, the only one living in London. And he's just, let's make a movie. I mean, and, you know, it is interesting that it is perceived as, you know, this very sort of far out psychedelic thing. But just like Sgt. Pepper, it also has roots in sort of English culture prior to the 60s the whole it's you know summertime let's rent a coach get everybody on the coach go on holiday to the seaside we'll drink you know guinness and sing songs and so like sergeant pepper they're taking things from the past and they're giving it they're they're dousing it in acid so to speak and i think that's why in some cases i think sergeant pepper is held up so well because it isn't just strictly a psychedelic album with all of the sort of effects of, of psychedelia. Obviously, it is a psychedelic album. There's no question about it. But there's certainly much more to it. And the whole idea of them taking on this persona of this band is kind of, it, that's an old 
literary convention of of somebody or or some bodies taking on you know the role or taking on the act of somebody else and and magical mystery tour was very much the same thing and even the music to some degree i mean your mother should know and again it's always kind of paul who's able to sort of say okay let's do something different but what have we learned what can we take with us from the past i mean i think john you know did this to some degree i mean the benefit of for the benefit of mr kite i think is very much john looking back at you know circuses and everything i mean it's based on an old poster you know so uh i, I think that's one of the reasons why their music holds up so well is, you know they were so well schooled you know they they obviously they loved rock and roll and they loved american rhythm and blues but they also grew up with you know english dance hall music and you know uh, english folk music and you know sh american you know great the great american songbook american show music you know obviously the you know england london has this great great history of theater of musical theater so they they come they come to the party with all of these amazing influences and then create something wholly different and wholly new. Yes, and I think that the Magical Mystery Tour, you really can't help but talk about Sgt. Pepper because Sgt. Pepper is really, it begs to be on film. And they've shot, well, the first two films they shot of that year were Penny Lane and Strawberry Fields Forever, which initially were going to probably be on that album. And then they shot A Day in the Life. That was a separate film. And then finally they're on a worldwide broadcast of All You Need Is Love. So those things, they're going right into Magical Mystery Tour. There's almost, the way the Magical Mystery Tour is compiled, there's almost a video for every song. Yeah. And actually, and I talk about this in the book, they were very close to making a, what I don't know what the phrase was, but like a video album of Sgt. Pepper. I mean, they had hired a production company and already started working on it, but it, it didn't happen. So the, this idea, and again, I, I thought that was important, because it, it, again, it shows how some of these films don't just happen out of thin air. They're not just happening, you know, serendipitously. They're just, you know, falling out of the sky. That there is context. There is there is reasons why these things. They were already thinking visually. You know, I mean, let's face it. The, the psychedelic experience lends itself to a visual experience, and I think that's part of what they wanted to do. It's part of what they were seeing. You know, they were they were in London. They went to the UFO club and, you know, they saw what was going on with Pink Floyd and the soft machine. You know, they saw this come. They saw this coming, really. I mean, those groups took it beyond the Beatles. And of course, you know, Pink Floyd was they were signed to, to EMI. I believe it was the Columbia imprint and they were recording at Abbey Road. And so, you know, part of what I wanted to do was. The Beatles were influencing everything, but they were also influenced by what was going on, too. There was this constant give and take. And I think that's the richness of the period, too, is and as you follow the sort of evolution of music in the 60s, it's it's moving forward and moving backwards, moving forward, moving backwards, being heavily influenced or creating you're creating something totally new that no one had ever done before. You know, I mean, when Traffic comes out with their first album, I mean, really, was there anything like that? I mean, right now you'd listen to it and it doesn't sound very radical, but they were very different. I'm just giving, you know, one example. And so there was always something new or, or going backwards. I mean, the Beatles were they really liked, but then later sort of scorned a little bit the sort of British blues explosion, you know, Fleetwood Mac and you know, uh, John Mayall and, and all of that stuff, you know, that was a thing that was happening that they were, that they liked because they knew it was authentic. Th th their music obviously in the beginning wasn't blues based or blues influenced like, you know, the Stones and the Animals and, you know, Van Morrison and, you know, many others. Th they, were, they were more strictly rock and roll and rhythm and blues and pop, you know, so, there's this constant churning. And I think just as, as, as psychedelic music is happening, it's, it, all, it happens, but then it kind of burns out very quick. And we sort of get the kind of next thing pretty fast. You know, it sort of burns very brightly 
for a short period of time in terms of its popularity. And then it kind of very quickly fades. I mean, look at the, look at the White Album. I mean, the White, there's really, if you think about it, there's really nothing psychedelic about it. It's almost a reaction against, you know, the sort of, you know, Sergeant Pepper magical mystery tour. That's why they made the cover all white. That was, you know, this minimalist sort of thing. I mean, it's, that's what it was about. You know, everybody after, everybody after they heard music from Big Pink, it was sort of like that everything changed for everybody in England. It blew people away in England because they, they had nothing like that over there, you know, except for maybe Fairport Convention. But I think they, I think they come maybe their sound is still evolving at that point. Magical Mystery Tour, we all know that the Beatles pretty much self-produced that. They directed it and they wrote it. But they they actually had some professionals lined up to work on that film that you stayed in the book. You have uh, Ian Dallas, Scottish actor. Uh, he was going to write it, I believe, wasn't he? Yes. I mean, they had they they were running the show, but they had a they had plenty of people helping them, you know, at various stages, including very much the sort of editing stage. And I talked to one of the cinematographers, this guy, I think it was a cinematographer, a camera operator, Michael Saracen. And he loved working on Magical Mystery Tour because he had worked on these, you know, just very kind of straightforward, normal sort of film productions. And he said, you know, I get to Magical Mystery Tour and it's this like free form, you know, thing. He said, I, it was so much fun. He goes, I just enjoyed it. He goes, I loved working with Paul. They were just always had ideas. And it was like, let's try this and let's experiment. And, and he had nothing but just, you know, great feelings about it. So the, the editing is, is, is really where a lot of the professionals came in and a lot of the work came in to get it into some kind of form, some kind of shape. I don't think it was ever intended to be a television show. I think they intended it to be a film but i think once they sort of figured out what it was i think they realized well what do we do with this thing it's 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 not you know it, a film is you know a 90 minutes roughly so what do we do and so i guess they figure well let's we'll show it on television and that might have been you know because they saw the audience that uh, happened for the Our World broadcast. And television is, you know, is coming on more now in England. So um, it's, it's weird. It's, it's, like, it's like the runt of the litter in some ways. And it's, it's almost hard to categorize. I mean, I don't, I don't know about you, but I first saw it as a film in a movie theater at, in the 70s at those midnight, late night cult movie showings where they would you know, show Freaks and El Topo and, you know, Zachariah and, you know, Billy Jack, and you know, just movies for movies for teenagers, movies for college kids at midnight. You'd go with all your friends and, you know, you know how it would go. <laughs> and, you know, so that's how I first saw it. And I remember seeing it going, oh, OK, because <laughs> I had never seen anything like that before at that point in my life. So I guess, I don't know how else to put this. I guess I wasn't impressed with it. it. It didn't leave an impression on me. I mean, it had some really good music on it, but you're watching it as someone who was just used to watching regular movies, you know, that were just normal narrative films. So um, it, it is a film at this point. I mean, that's, that's how it's perceived. That's how it's when you watch it, whether it's on DVD or Blu-ray, or if you if you're lucky enough to see it in a movie theater, you know it it is a film. It's not a television show. Yeah, it's too bad they didn't keep it underground because it probably would have it wouldn't have been a bomb. It would have been a hit, but an underground hit. I mean, it was probably the wrong audience to show it on TV. Obviously, I don't know if they were talked into it. They thought they could get away with it, and they did not. I just think that they felt, given the length of it. And given given how hot they were, and let's get something out. Um, I think that's what they thought. And NBC was originally going to show it, and then they said, "No, nah, we're not gonna we're not gonna show this." Okay, I mean that's it's not gonna happen. So to show it on Boxing Day in black and white, and you know televisions in England in 1967 were these very small little black and white 
things, your microwave is probably bigger, you know, than what that television was, you know? So it obviously loses a lot, you know, anything that was psychedelic, part of the appeal visually, whether it's a video or a movie or an album cover is it's really, it's, it's colors. It's, 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 that's what it is. It's multicolor. It's technicolor, what it, whatever you want to call it. It's to reflect whatever, whatever a psychedelic experience is supposed to be, whatever that is, which is an undefinable thing, whether that experience is something that you achieve through drugs or meditation or whatever, you know, so obviously it's Marshall McLuhan, the medium is the message. And in that case, the medium kill the message or kill the messenger. Well, they got a second chance at Psychedelia with Yellow Submarine, which it, the whole style of that is so different and it's, it is very adult. So in this case, it totally worked just like six months later or eight months later. Right. Now, of course, the Beatles have nothing to do with it. You know, they, I mean, they're not in it except for that little cameo at the end. Their voices are not in it. But obviously the music, their music is the, is the center of it. And it's very much influenced by Sgt. Pepper. And the filmmakers, when they started making the film and conceiving it, Pepper wasn't released yet, but they were able to hear uh, an advanced copy of it. I believe it was a, a tape of it to give them an idea what to do and how, kind of how to do it. And so the, the people that produced it were the same people, as you know, that produced the Beatles cartoons, which the Beatles hated, okay? And that was a lot of the reason why the Beatles wanted nothing to do with Yellow Submarine initially is because of how much they hated those cartoons, which were not shown in England. They were shown in America. And, you know, I talk all about this, you know, who the folks are that made the cartoons. And I talk about, you know, how the production of Yellow Submarine was done was different. And um, Hans Edelman and his influence, how important he is to the look of it and to the film and to the people that worked on it. Uh, it's the whole idea of the fact that they did it in such a short period of time, uh, roughly about a year, where, you know, Disney feature length animated films took three years to make. Um, you know, I go into this in depth, but I, I do give credit to Dr. Bob Hieronymus who's written two books on Yellow Submarine and the depth that he goes into and all the people that he interviews, I, you know, I tried as hard as I could to tell the story and bring some new things to it and tell it in some different ways. But I mean, I can't think of any of any of the films where you get, get it so in depth as his, I mean, I know it seems weird on plugging somebody else's books here, but, you know, and I, you know, I, I cooperated with, they cooperated with me. They were very helpful. You know, they knew about the book and helped me with some interviews and the wonderful people, their hearts in the right place. They were very involved in one of the last sort of restorations and, you know, reissues of the film, showing it in theaters and celebrating the film. I mean, they're, they're integral to the story of Yellow Submarine, Dr. Bob and, and his team. So I, I wanted to tell that story to some degree, too. I, so I, I give credit where credit is due. I think that's important. We do cover some new, I, what I think is new ground, because I don't think Yellow Submarine is probably the one film that we don't get a lot of background on because the Beatles don't have a lot to do with it. And it's too bad they didn't at least lend their voices, because I think that would have made it even more interesting. But uh, we got what we got, and it's considered a classic. Yes. There's no question about it. I mean, it's like I said before, it's really the first major, you know, animated film for adults that's feature length. You know, it's not 10 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever. And it is it is groundbreaking. Un unfortunately, and I get into this in the book that, you know, United Artists just really didn't leave it out there as long as they should have. They 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 didn't give it the sort of legs, as I guess they say in the in the industry and it, it closed very quickly. I guess they didn't know what to do with it. You know, they didn't quite know how to market it because there really was no precedent. There was no, you know, I mean, you couldn't market it like a Disney film because it wasn't. And as a matter of fact, Heinz Edelman hated Disney films and, and partially um, 
some of the characters in Yellow Submarine have these like Mickey Mouse ears. And that was him goofing on Disney. And that's what's so bizarre when I first heard Peter Jackson is going to do uh, a new movie of Let It Be, and it's going to be released by Disney. <laughs> it was like my head exploded because you've got Peter Jackson who did Lord of the Rings, which the Beatles wanted to do. Okay. And then it's coming out through Disney, who the filmmakers who made Yellow Submarine hated. They hated Disney. Okay. You know, Paul actually. Uh, at one point, I think I mentioned this in the book, said to the filmmakers, you should really make this more like a Disney movie, <laughs> which, you know, they they didn't say, no, Paul, we're not going to do that. But obviously they said nothing and then went away and made their movie. I mean, once the Beatles saw what this was going to be, they loved it. They absolutely loved it. And, you know, they all went to the premiere and I mean, they, they loved Yellow Submarine, you know, so I, I think there's a story that uh, Donnie Harrison tells George's son that when he was a kid, um, one day he was at school and there was, kids were like making fun of him and they had seen Yellow Submarine and realized that this kid is, is George Harrison's son. And so Donnie goes home and he goes, why didn't you tell me you were in the Beatles? <laughs> I'm sure I'm not telling this exactly how it is, but it's that's basically what this, what the story is, you know, there's another great story there too, where I think it's when Donnie Harrison, he's graduating from college and, and he says to him, Oh, so how old are you? And he says, how, how old he is? He goes, Oh yeah, we were making pepper at that age, <laughs> you know? So that's George Harrison for you. Yes, indeed. And you know, then the Beatles didn't rest very long when the came out, which was, I think summer of 68, they were already back in the studio in January of 69 with the next film. So everybody knows the background of this one. And you've written a separate book on on uh, Let It Be film on, in your 33 and the third series. Yes, this this one here, if I can hold go. it up. And you know, I what I should have really done, this is so amazing we're doing this today, because this book, I today I was shipped four copies of it. It has been translated into Chinese. Okay. <laughs> if you can believe that. Okay, it's been translated already into Japanese and Italian, but but now it is coming out in China. And so there's 2 billion people there. And if 1% of them buy it, I'm going to be a rich man. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I mean, so obviously I, I visited this place twice. I mean, the Let It Be book that I just showed is really about the album. But of course, I do talk about the film, obviously. So it. It going back again, I mean, you know, Let It Be was so scorned and, and even the Beatles themselves didn't like it. But think of how many times now it's been revisited by the Beatles. You have Let It Be Naked. OK, you have the Get Back series film. You have all of the audio Let It Be reissues that came out um, in, in 2020, I guess it was, or 2021. And um it's it's it keeps being revisited and if you if you listen to the rumors peter jackson makes it sound like it's probably not done yet either um, we never did get a director's cut um we never did get um the rooftop concert on uh you know cd or or, or dvd or blu-ray we only got it as if you watching the series they did um, they, 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 it, it is streamable, I believe. I believe you can still stream just the audio of the of the rooftop concert. And of course, on the anniversary of the rooftop concert, there was a separate film that Peter Jackson made that was shown in theaters that was just of the rooftop concert. So this let it be thing that everybody supposedly hates, it 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 just won't die. It just it will not it will not go away. It's almost like I think part of it is 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 obviously it's not the last album they made. That's Abbey Road, but it is the end of the Beatles. So I almost think that we're all collectively subconsciously we keep going back to it because we want to change the ending. Where the ending is, you know, the Beatles don't break up and they keep going on, <laughs> or something to that effect. You know, I keep trying to figure this out, you know. Um, I, I really wasn't crazy about the, the Let It Be Naked. I actually, I grew up with the Let It Be album, the way it was released in 70. 
and it's the way that I know it and I like it. I do like the the Get Back series. I, I like the Let It Be film. I think for what it is, I think it, you know, it's Michael Lindsay Hogg is a great filmmaker. I interviewed him for this book. I interviewed him for the Let It Be book. Michael is, you know, a, a, a Renaissance man. I mean, he's an artist. Um, he directed many films and TV shows. He did Brideshead Revisited. He was one of the important directors on Ready, Steady, Go, probably the most um, influential uh, television music, British music television sh series. Some people might argue it's Top of the Pops or whatever. But so um, th there's so much to unpack with, with, with Let It Be and Get Back. I mean, it's, I'm lucky that I was able to write this book and and see see it and even you know the the blu-ray came out i mean i was very lucky because if i had not seen it it would have been a major gaping hole in in this book there's no question about it i mean what is it is it a movie is it a television series i mean it, it really is a sort of it got delayed because of covid and simultaneously we get streaming suddenly now becomes this other animal beyond just Netflix and you can stream movies because the whole film industry has to change the entire way that they do things because people are not going to the movies during lockdown. And so it becomes an, another one of these kind of streaming events in some ways. Again, you know, Marshall McLuhan, you know, the medium becomes the message. So as it's being delayed, and as it becomes now a series, you know, Peter Jackson is, uh, is allowed to, you know, just keep going. You know, you know how film directors are. They always want to make these things longer. I think authors sometimes want to make their books longer. My manuscript was 500 pages. The book you have in your hand there is 350 pages. So, you know, Disney probably thinks, well, you know, Peter has already given us the director's cut. You know, it's close to eight hours. It's not six. It's closer to eight. You know, I mean, I, I watched it as many people did. It was over Thanksgiving weekend. And, it, you know, we watched it each night. And, you know, it, it was great. I mean, even for people who weren't Beatle fans, uh, it was an event. I mean, people, a lot of people watched it. You know, I'm surprised at how patient people were with the first episode, the first couple of hours, because it is somewhat tedious. And it is very reflective of what it's like for a rock band in the studio in the beginning of making an album. It's a lot of like, oh, what do you think of this song? Or what do you think of this riff? Or, oh yeah, you want to set that microphone up? I mean, it's a lot of, it's inside baseball is what it is. It's not glamor. It's not rock stars partying. It's, it's a lot of just, you know, getting stuck started kind of thing so i mean obviously then it picks up and uh i mean I, I love it i've watched it twice now because i watched it when it was first aired and then to write the book i went back and i watched it again and took very copious notes yeah i've watched it twice and there's so much to see i, I haven't i want to watch it a third time at some point but i don't know when that's going to be but it's the gift that keeps giving, you know, it's so, so long and there's so much information in it. And you made a good point that people, I mean, it, people rip on that album, maybe even more than Beatles for Sale. And obviously if you rank Beatle albums, there's gotta be a bottom third. So let it be winds up in that bottom third, but people just cannot get enough of it. They're demanding some kind of director's cut and demanding way more than they probably would ever want. But that's how Beatle fans are. That's how we are. You know, we, we always want more. And, and it's a function of the way that it was made, where it was a documentary film. So they had these Nagra tape recorders running all the time. I interviewed a lot of people that worked on the film for both books. And, you know, they were told that as soon as one Beatle walked in the room, start filming, start recording audio. And you, you don't turn anything off until all four Beatles have left the room. So that's why you have hours and hours and hours of bootlegs. And, you know, that's something I didn't get into in depth in this book. I talk about it. I, I touch on it. But I, I got into that a bit uh, with the Let It Be book because I thought with that book, because it was about the album, I thought it was more 
um, it was more for that purpose, you know. And there's been a lot of, you know, books written about the bootlegs. You know, Doug Sulpey's book is probably the probably the most in-depth on it, but there's been many other books on the bootlegs. You know, Beatles bootlegs is a, a whole thing unto itself that, you know, I am not an expert on. And I have a lot of them. People have given them to me over the years and it's fun listening to them, but I'm not a collector. I'm not an expert. And I felt for this book, I didn't want to go too much in depth about that because it's about the visuals, not the audio. Yeah, I, I, I don't think there's a final word on this film yet, you know, on get back slash let it be. Is this the end? Does we ever get any more? I think that if this is the end, I think this is a, I mean, we've, we've gotten plenty from it. And there might be a couple of minor things that we could use, like you mentioned, the, the rooftop concert. People want to get that on vinyl as well, the, the full concert and you know there may be some other things to do but it seems like it, it doesn't seem like apple is really putting a priority on on any more let it be get back stuff like that that ship has sailed perhaps at least for now at least at least for now i mean we all thought we were going to get a rubber soul box and i guess we're going to get this red and blue and there's a new song that's going to be part of it um you know, I've heard some people say that maybe they're going to go back and they're going to they're going to revisit the anthology and maybe that's what Peter Jackson's going to get involved in. But, you know, these things are rumors. And you know what that means? A lot of times that's all it is. It's 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 just rumors. I mean, they haven't reissued any of the soundtrack records in any kind of big way other than let it be. So, I mean, maybe what they could do is they could do a soundtrack box set of rarities you know a, a hard day's night help magical mystery tour um you know magical mystery tour i know is kind of a hodgepodge it was capital records who came up with the 12 inch version of it when they reissued the dvd and blu-ray of the film they reissued it with the original uk ep that you know was not going to get released in america and that's why capital came up with the magical mystery tour and maybe yellow submarine you know there's a lot of incidental music too you know i when i did my research and as you know from reading the book i talk about this there's so much kind of incidental music that goes on in in like help and uh there's things in magical mystery tour so maybe they could do like a you know odds and sods you know the beatles at the movies they 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 blew it with the beatles real music i mean that was kind of awful with the awful cover. I mean, it was, you know, some of the little trinkets that came inside were nice. I mean, that came out a long time ago, you know? I mean, there is a rarity to that. There's the one side is the Beatles kind of medley. And then initially, I think on the other side, they had an interview, I believe, with the Beatles, some kind of interview or something like that. So that's been long, that's long gone. You, you, you can't get it unless you can find a used copy on Discogs or eBay. Or something but um you, you just we don't know you just there, there's still so much that you know can be done people think really is there anything else left i mean considering how other artists where they just keep coming out with things i, mean, I don't know how you could come out with any more music from jeff buckley i mean he only made one album really one studio album but yet they continue to i'm, I'm not being facetious i'm not picking on him but it's like, I mean, Jimi Hendrix, they continue to find, you know, new things to put out. I mean, a lot of that is live concerts, which is great. But I, I think we're going to, I think there's still, there's still more, more to come, especially now that Peter Jackson is involved in his audio team and they're able to do things now that they couldn't do before. I, I'm sure that they probably wished that they had Jackson's um, technology now, uh, uh, technology back when they did the um, Hollywood Bowl stuff for the Ron Howard film. I mean, they had this D-mix um, um, technology. I actually interviewed Giles Martin about that at the time. But what Jackson has now is even more involved in that. And of course, you know, the Hollywood Bowl was always a problem because of all the screaming and everything. And, you know, that's, that's what the problem was with that. But tomorrow never knows. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a... I'm trying to understand the future of Beatles uh, releases because 
the audience is not really growing, it's shrinking. And I think that with all of our social media that we're involved in, it, it gives a kind of a false sense of how many people do follow them. For example, I was surprised that when uh, Get Back aired on uh, Disney Plus, that that series Get Back was not even the top 10 of streaming shows that week. And that surprised me. And it's, it just made me th- kind of take take stock in that it's a it's not a growing uh not a growing audience but a shrinking one and it's becoming more of a niche audience i think so it'll be interesting to see how they approach releases like this red and blue thing i i was kind of a surprise to me or even this new song when you have when most people are waiting for rubber soul Right. You know, again, I think, you know, it's again becomes like, you know, I I hate to keep referring to Marshall McLuhan, but it is like the medium is the message. So the Beatles, you know, two or three years ago are obviously appealing to these aging baby boomers, supposedly. Let's just say that for the sake of argument. So why would you why would you stream it on Disney? Why would Disney have anything to do with it? Disney is for young people. It's for children. It's for teens. It's, you know, it's all the superheroes. So, you know, I, that's what I don't quite understand. Like, why? I, I'm going to guess it's money that Disney offered them chunks and boatloads of money. I mean, it, it wasn't there a better place for a, a different company that would have been better? I mean, I, I don't know. So, of course, if the regular Disney viewer is not going to tune into that, the, the, the Beatle fan is probably doesn't even have Disney+. Plus. Because they're, it's not their thing, you know. And I know that was like a, a, there was a whole thing, and I mentioned this in the book, that the demographic of it, they made such a thing of the, the age group of the people who watched it as if it was some kind of sin that these old fogies watched it, you know, ageism, you know what I mean? We live in this politically correct time, but God forbid you're, you're, you're over 21, you know, or you're over 30, you know, it's like... I think young people think that, you know, old age is a disease that you contract, you know what I mean? You, you catch it. And if you stay away from old people, you won't get it, you know? So I, I understand your point. I also think there's a lot of young people that are plugged in to the Beatles. I mean, you were at the Beatle Fest in, in Chicago. I mean, there's a lot of young people there. It's not just all the old, old timers. And I don't think it's just the, the, the old people buying these reissues. I mean, yeah, I guess it is a niche, but I think sometimes they have unrealistic expectations of what this stuff is supposed to sell for. You know, it costs X amount of money. And also they, they do offer different um, formats. You can buy the big box set or just the album or just the CD. They have things in the middle. Um, you know, I don't know what the numbers are. I don't know how much money they're making or they're not making. I think Disney was probably disappointed. You know, everything's blockbusters. A company like Disney, like if it's not a blockbuster runaway $200 million success, it's a failure. I was surprised that Disney got involved too. But like you say, money, like I was one of those people who did not have Disney Plus and I signed up for it. And it took me about two months to cancel it. But I yeah, I was signing up for it. So I don't know if that was part of the plan, but maybe maybe many people did did keep it so i i don't know but i would say that this red and blue album that is coming out before rubber soul i think that's a sign that they're trying to appeal to the widest amount of people and that would be a sales issue and i get that but i thought it it seemed like they were going by the, with these box sets because once you do like five of them well you got to do the rest don't you so that's what fans are expecting and i think that those some of those earlier albums, those might be more niche. But again, I think the whole Beatle, the Beatles are becoming more of a niche uh, band and, and style of music anyway, just like most of the '60s music is, and almost becoming like what jazz is. You know that this kind of niche. I think in the future, that's it'll just have a very strong following that it, but it just won't be mainstream. We'll see. the The death of rock and roll has been reported many times. And and every time it's been an, no, but sometimes you know what I almost think it is. It's not an anti-rock thing. I think it's an anti-group thing. 
I don't think the record business wants to deal with groups anymore. I think they love the fact that pretty much everybody on the Billboard Top 100 is a solo artist because they don't have to get involved with all the chaos that goes on with groups. The infighting and the, you know, I want my song on the A side and, you know, I hate you and, you know, you don't have to deal with the Gallagher brothers and the, and the Davies brothers beating themselves up on stage and, you know, the, you know, the Robinson brothers and, the, you know, but that's what makes it so great is that volatility is what made these groups so great. And the fact that you have all these amazing people in one group, you know, the, the Buffalo Springfield, the Birds, the Beatles, the Stones, the Yardbirds, the Who, Pink Floyd, you know, um, you know, Little Feet. Roxy Music, you know, Steely Dan. It's great because you get the Eagles. I mean, you get all these people that can sing and write songs and play, and then you get it together. You know, the fact that like people would come from all different parts of the country and then meet up in LA. I mean, that's the Eagles. I mean, all those guys were from all different parts of the country, but they all came together at the Troubadour in LA and create, whether you like the Eagles or not, and created this incredibly unique sound that became so popular, you know? I think that's why a lot of these groups are still around and they're still touring too, because they actually have something to say and their music actually is rooted in something. Where you see nowadays with pop music, with rap music, it's, it's, it comes and it goes. Their superstars don't last very long, you know? I mean, we're, here we are 60 something years later and we're still talking, we're still talking about the Beatles. I agree. I don't see new music today is so homogenized and so what I call laptop music. You know, it's not made by a band like the Beatles were doing in January of 1969, hashing it on under very strange circumstances and coming out with something at the end of it, at the end of 30 days. How many bands could do that now? I mean, I don't think they could. They're not nurtured in that way. And record no. Not they do not nurture bands anymore. They, like I, I think you make a good point there. They want the solo artist because they can focus on one person. Image. Dress and put across one image. And it's not about the art, what the artist creates. It's about what the management and the record industry creates for them, which was the opposite of how it was in the 60s, 70s, and the 80s, really. I think MTV, Madonna, I think changed it. You know, where, yeah, Image was part of, rock and roll. There's no question about it. You know, Mick Jagger, you know, Jim Morrison, whoever the case may be. I mean, it was part of it. But I think once MTV and Madonna kind of became dominant, then the amount of the pie that is image versus versus talent or originality, I think it, it's just, that's just, it's just the way it is. You know, I think culture itself has just become homogenized, partially because of what we're doing right now, this technology, where the whole world is connected, which is great, but what it does is it, it tends to sort of, it flattens out regionalism, you know? I mean, that's what you had in the 60s and the 70s, you know, all these trends, you know, the Greenwich Village folk scene, you know, Motown, the San Francisco sound, the LA sound, the Boston sound, what it, whatever it was, it was, it was, you know, people from various regions creating something unique. The Allman Brothers Band. I mean, it, that's as organic as it gets. There's no question about it, you know? And then, of course, you have these places that draw creative people in this country. New York, LA, San Francisco, Boston, you know, even New Orleans, you know? Wh wh where is all of that? It, what was the last time we've had a scene in this country? You know, maybe the grunge scene or, you know, when a rap first started in, you know, Compton and, and Queens and places. Yeah, that was that was a real cultural explosion. Whether you like the music or not, it was that was authentic. There was no question about it. And it was creative and it had a message. Um, and it was it was reflective of people. It was it was a folk music. It wasn't folk in its musical style but in terms of its effect. But what was the last scene? I mean, I don't remember the last time anybody said, oh yeah, have you heard that new sound from Swahili or that new sound from Idaho or whatever? And, and I'm not saying that to, to be negative or facetious. It's just, it's just the nature of, you know, I think the way it used to be is that culture, culture drove things and now technology does. Everything is driven by technology. And again, McLuhan, the 
It's the medium, it's Spotify, it's streaming, it's how many Twitter followers do you have? You know, how outrageous is your TikTok account? I mean, I hear these stories that they won't sign certain artists if they don't have X amount of Twitter followers, you know? I mean, Don Was is the only person who's a musician who's running a, re a record company, a major record company. I know Blue Note is part of, you know, the larger, whatever the larger company is, but it used to be, you know, Ahmed Erdogan and, you know, Jack Holzman and, you know, Sam Phillips and, you know, all, all of these folks who were, you know, real record people, you know, uh, Tom Dowd and Jerry Wexler. And I mean, the people who made the records owned the company, you know, the, the people with Stax Music and, you know, uh, you know, Alan Toussaint down in New Orleans. I, I mean, it's, we just, we don't have, it's such a richness of, of musical culture we had in America, you know, the whole sort of, you know, post-war period as far as popular music. I mean, prior to that, you had the, the incredible jazz age. I mean, think about it, Louis Armstrong, Duke Ellington. I mean, I could go on and on. It's extraordinary. And what do we have now? And I don't, and, I, and when you say that, it sounds like, oh yeah, you're just an old guy and you know, you're living in the past and it's, what do they call it? Golden age thinking. You always think that what the past, it was, everything was always better and that sort of thing. I mean, I kept up with things like when Coldplay and all that was happening and Snow Patrol. And I liked that music. I thought that as far as pop music, I thought that was good and I liked it, but I haven't, I don't know what has come along really since then, you know? Yeah, I mean, a lot of younger people, I, I think, can't recognize something that's obvious to many of us, and that is Western civilization is in decline. <laughs> Quite obvious that the music reflects that. And I think you hit it on the head, the technology drives it, as opposed to in the past, the artists. Yeah. And you're right, I think MTV did slow down the process a bit, and it, that pie of image that piece of the pie got did get much bigger that I do think though there are a lot of young people that because of Spotify and stuff they are more exposed to music from the past and there are a lot of younger people who are open to it and there's also a lot of young people who are into collecting vinyl I mean I see this so I go to record stores I go to record fairs and you see these young people and you know they're buying good stuff you know interesting things and they and they listen to their whatever their own generation's music is too so i wouldn't i wouldn't i don't want to paint the picture totally black you know to quote the rolling stones i, I wouldn't i wouldn't go that far because there is that element that i do see that that is heartening and i do run into a lot of young people sometimes when i do you know book signings or whatever and they're interested and they're buying you know books about the 60s there's a lot of young people who realize wow things were really cool back then i mean you really People really had a lot of fun. I always say the 70s is the last time anybody had any fun, you know? It's like, so So it's not, you know, I, I think young people, they love this movie, Almost Famous. You know, I think they, they see that as kind of like, you know, oh yeah, wow, that's really cool. Because they see it through the eyes of those characters who are their age now, you know? So, so maybe it isn't all gloom and doom. Sometimes I always think when things seem like they're, they're over and done with, that that's when something comes along that nobody saw coming and, and revives everything. So, you know, you know, we'll keep our fingers crossed and, and, and be hopeful. Well, I certainly am a, a, a fan of physical media. I think that's one of the reasons why the vinyl resurgence, resurgence has happened among younger people because they just like that physical thing as opposed to a digital stream. And I think there's some to be said for that. And so I'm a big, I've been buying lots of books over the past 10 years. So I am a big proponent of still buying, you know, actual books. And uh, all, you don't need any electricity to read it. You sit on the sunshine and there you go. You know, so your book is one of the things that is still something new coming out. And there's still, there is a lot of new stuff coming out. And, and it's it's gotten easier to self-publish and get the books in more hands and via digital me methods, et cetera. So these are all good things. Yeah. I mean, my book is, it's, it's, it's uh, published by a traditional publisher, you know, a pretty big size publisher, Roman and Littlefield. It's the backbeat imprint, but uh, you know, it's out there, you know, through Amazon and bookstores and, you know, it's, it's been selling pretty well. 
and yeah, I mean, I still buy books and I, you know, I think young people, I see a lot of YouTube videos of these young booktubers talking about books and like excited about books and going to bookstores and doing video at bookstores. And so, you know, it, it I try not to get too like cynical or, you know, it, it, these are tough times we're living in. The last few years has been brutal, but you know, there, there are some good, there are some good signs. And so, uh, you know, we'll try to we'll try to latch on to the positive. And I, I hope that young people read this book. I think there's a lot of 60s history in there. It isn't just a book about the Beatles. And maybe that'll interest them. I think it will. And there's there's plenty. That's one of the great things about this book is that it's not just about the Beatles, but the time period surrounding them and what helped make them make these films. Because it did not happen in a vacuum. Yes. All right, Steve. Well, this was a great talk. I really appreciate it. Thank you. And uh, what I'm, I'm going to leave some links below so people can directly click to your book with that wonderful new technology. And yes. hopefully we'll get them to buy some hard copies. That'd be great. That'd be great. And make sure if you, if you read the book, you know, please, you know, go on Amazon and review it and rate it and, you know, be objective. I mean, you know, it's like, I, I'm interested in what people think. You know, I know there's some, I have some problems with the book. It's, it's always hard. It's long, it took years to write this book, well over three years, probably closer to three and a half years. So, and I have a lot of respect for people who do this, who write, you know, who write Beatle books, you know, people like Mark Lewison and Bruce Spicer and Ken Womack. I mean, they're, they're extraordinary. And I know all these folks and there's a lot of great Beatles books and there's more books coming out this year, later this year and early next year, some really good Beatle books. Well, a lot to look forward to, and hopefully we'll get some more Beatle releases, but there's always something coming up. And um, yes, so we, we're still kind of, we are still in a golden age, so we're not going to yes. too much, but <laughs> right. These are the good old days. That's what Carly Simon said. All right, Steve. Well, thank you for joining us and we'll have you back maybe sometime. Great. Thanks very much. I really appreciate it, Matt. Cheers. Mm -hmm.